Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, API facade design pattern. This is the first of a four part series where we're going to do uh, an idea of really quick webinars. Uh, it's probably 20 minutes of content. We'll probably try to land it in about 30 minutes. And uh, we're going to do four of these. It's an experiment we're going to run in March, so we'd love to hear your feedback uh, once we're through with this. As a reminder, please check out our API craft group on Google. Fantastic community uh, is thriving there lately and a bunch of great content. If you have any questions about API, whether it's on the business side, how to monetize it, or on the technical side, how to architect it, uh, it's a great place to check out what's happening. We also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Apogee. This webinar, for example, will be posted there uh, once we edit it down. And we just a couple weeks ago launched a new IRC channel called API Craft on Freenode. It's a great spot to hang out and collaborate in real time. So here's the arc of the series that we'll be talking about uh, in the next four episodes. Today we'll be talking about the overview, and uh, then next week we'll dig into some of the common patterns that we see around um, the idea of creating an API facade. On episode three, we're actually dig into some of the uh, technology that we've seen people use to accomplish an API facade. And then finally, we'll talk about the people, uh, the team that's needed to, to make this happen. All right, so in terms of episode one, this is the agenda that we're going to bang through pretty quickly here in less than 25 minutes. We're going to talk about what is the goal, dig a little bit into the problem that stops us from accomplishing that goal, talk about some of the anti-patterns where people try to solve um, the, the, the problems to meet the goal that we're talking about that don't work or don't work very well, and then we'll talk about what I feel is, is one of the best solutions that I've seen out there. We'll go a little bit into the how-to, uh, but really that's what we're going to talk about in more detail next week, and then finally a quick hit on the benefits, which should probably be really intuitively obvious to all of us, but might be helpful for when we're, uh, we're talking about these topics with other folks. So let's dig right in. The goal. What is the goal that we're trying to accomplish? Well, if you've, talked, if you've heard Apogee talk before, you've seen this slide. Uh, this is what we consider to be the API value chain. And the key thing here is that we're focused on this, this webinar is tar targeted toward the API team. Uh, specifically an API uh, architect or an enterprise architect and also a product manager and you can think of it as like an API designer. That's who this webinar is targeted at. And what we're trying to accomplish is how do you take all of these internal systems and make them really useful for the application developer. That is our goal. Now oftentimes when we, when we talk about this, people, people uh, point out that there is an issue where their internal systems are really complex. And even though, say, a modern day application developer building an iPhone app or an Android app or just a web app, um, even though they might want to access the value we have in these internal systems, they're actually too com inherently too complex to share um, in sort of a typical web API fashion. Um, but the good news is we're seeing a lot of archetypes, a lot of folks who are actually um, crafting ways to do this even with complex systems. So here's an example of a company called Trade King. They are uh, an online broker. So they have created, this is a, just a screenshot I took of their, their API. And if you look at this really quickly, you can see this is a beautifully designed web API. Simple HTTP gets. Um, actually, if you scroll down, you'll see it's really simple to do an HTTP post. And uh, this is easy for an application developer to understand on the one hand. On the other hand, this is actually plugged directly into one of the most important um, information systems we have uh, in the world, and that is the, the global trading platforms to, to exchange stocks. Um, there's actually a lot of complexity that the folks at Trade King have been able to um, overcome to make this API work in the way that it does. Uh, it's not always easy, but they accomplished it. So for, for those of us that are thinking about how to make this happen when we have a set of complex systems, we should you think, think of companies like Trade King as a, sort of a, uh, an archetype that we can try to, that we can try to emulate. So, that's the goal, is to take whatever internal system or set of systems that we have and try to articulate it in a way that an application developer would understand. But what is the problem? The problem is these systems of record uh, that are actually the thing that the API communicates with. Um, the virtues of a system of record in any organization of significant size is that the systems are often stable. They've been hardened over years or decades. They're dependable. In fact, um, often key aspects of a business are run on top of, of these systems of record. 
The problem with some of the systems of record is that they're often based on legacy technologies um, that aren't easy to expose to web standards like HTTP. There are many interdependencies. So you can imagine you have a core system, you want to expose it through an API, but you're not exactly sure what impact it will have on all the nonlinear dependencies that that system relies upon. And then thirdly, they're slowly changing. So these systems, um, by virtue of them being stable and dependable, they can't move as quickly as, say, the needs of an iPad developer or an iPhone developer and uh, the changing formats and technologies that they, that they want to see. So that's our fundamental problem. And the bad news is it actually gets worse because we're often not talking about just one big system. We're usually talking about an array of complementary systems that need to be used in order to make an API uh, useful or valuable to the, to the end user. So that's, that's sort of the setup of the problem. So at Apogee, we've had the benefit of seeing up close and personal how some of the leading companies in the world have tried to address this problem. And there's some ways that work and there are some ways that don't work. I'm gonna to just touch on three anti-patterns that I've seen from sort of an architectural or strategic way um, that makes it very difficult to get all these internal systems working for the long haul. So here's, here's three ways that I considered uh, not, not to do this. The first is what I call the build-up pattern. So the idea here is you've got a big system and some developer who is probably intimately familiar with the details of that big system looks at the core objects and exposes those through some format. It might be, say, a Java app server sitting in front of a, some kind of COBOL-based system or it might be something simpler than that. But somehow they get down to the object level of that system and then they put an XML uh, parsing layer on top of it. And what happens when you do that is a couple of things. On the, on the virtue side, you can get to version one pretty quickly, which is all good. If you had to choose between not doing something and doing something to get you into the market quickly, sometimes this is exactly the right thing to do. So you can get to version one, you can get there quickly. And the other benefit is the details of that system are often already understood by the internal developers. And by internal developers, I mean the people who are on the, app, on the API team, uh, you know, actually creating the API. The vices is, Oftentimes these systems, when you take them at the object level, it's, it's fine grain. In fact, it's too fine grain and it can become confusing to the application developer to actually understand how to make everything work. Um, often when you expose the details of your internal architecture, uh, it wasn't necessarily designed for external consumption. So it, it can be confusing. And then importantly, it can be inflexible because you're, you have a one-to-one -one mapping between how the system works and how it's exposed through the API. You can't always do the things that you need to do um, to create more compelling applications. So that's sort of this, this one pattern. And uh, you can see if you do a Google search for uh, different APIs that are publicly available, you can often see the symptoms of this approach because the API is overly complicated. It's sort of the number one giveaway that somebody just said, we've got the system, we're going to build out from it and create the API. Here's anti-pattern number two. Uh, this is the, the notion of doing an API by committee or uh, like an internal standards body. Um, the idea here is we know we have a bunch of internal complex systems. Often they're owned or managed uh, by different departments or at least different, different people with different opinions about how things should work. So uh, you create a standards document where you define your schema and what you want your URLs to look like. And then everybody independently sort of builds toward that goal out on out on the horizon. The virtues of doing this are again, if it's if you if you can get through the bureaucracy, which is sometimes a challenge, you can get to a version one. It might not be perfect, but at least you can get it out there, which is which is good. You can also create a sense of unification. In a big organization, that sense of unification is actually a huge political accomplishment, a bureaucratic accomplishment, which is not insignificant. That's a very important thing to accomplish, even though it might just be a document and not say a working fantastic API that type of thing can actually move an organization forward. And then also, uh, as standards bodies often do, it can create this um, sense of being comprehensive. You can create a comprehensive strategy, even if you don't implement all of it on day one. Now the vices are, it's usually pretty slow in terms of actually getting an implementation built. Um, you've got that standard doc out there and uh, you can get, even if you get the doc written quickly, then you need to have other folks build to the doc. So you, you ultimately end up with a lack of adherence across the enterprise. The third thing, which is just hard to overcome in this sort of committee approach, is you can end up with a really mediocre design where you compromise too many different variegated um, opinions about what the design should be, and it ends up being watered down, and then 
as a result of that, it's not very clear to the end developer um, how it's supposed to be used. And then finally, even if you had really high adherence and a fantastic design, the design itself can be subject to interpretation. So you don't, even though you might think you're hitting the mark, you, the mark is actually not um, hit all the time. So that is, in a nutshell, is this the second pattern of the of the standards committee. And then the final pattern is the notion of uh, what I call the copycat pattern. This is where a company or organization might be a little bit late to the market in exposing their API, but their closest competitor has an API available already. So they can get to a version one pretty quickly, um, and the application developers who might be users of their API might be familiar with the competitor's API, so there's actually sort of a built-in adoption curve uh, that you don't need to worry about, which is, which is pretty solid. Um, the vices to that are, first of all, you can end up with a me too looking API that's not very differentiated. And oftentimes APIs that have been around for a while already, they're not very strong APIs. Um, so it might not be differentiated and it might not be very good because you just copied something that's not very strong to begin with. And then secondly, sort of related to the non-differentiated aspect is um, you might not have taken advantage of the core value that your system provides because you just copied your nearest competitor and missed sort of your key value points. Um, so that's, that's not so good. On the other hand, you could get to market quickly. So when you think about these three the anti-patterns, um, the question obviously is what, what does a good pattern look like? So let's talk a little bit about um, the solution space. So playing off the, the last notion of a copycat, when you see a copycat API, it usually means that there is not a product manager on the API team, or if there is a product manager, they're not thinking about the API in terms of a pure product. So the key, the key about having a pure product approach to an API is that you think about the fundamentals of product management, which is make sure your product is credible, relevant, and differentiated. So when we advise people on how to go about solving this problem of creating a, a, a mess of internal systems into a beautiful API, you really need that product manager who's going to have a good touch, sort of a good style in terms of making those trade-offs and uh, making sure you're doing the right thing. Um, the other folks that you'll see on the API team are engineers, ops, QA, a community manager, architects. Uh, those are all important folks, but the product manager needs to be there in the first place. And then once the product manager is there helping you decide what the big picture looks like, um, then often it's up to the architect. So this next bit is really for uh, the architects to think about. The API facade pattern. The, the overall idea here with the facade is, is just as simple as it sounds. You just, you, the idea is to create a comprehensive, a, a, across the board look at what the API should be. And you do this in the spirit of who is the application developer and what is the app that the application the developer is, is, is trying to build. And uh, we used to call this uh, API virtualization. We usually call this the API virtualization tier, but we found after talking about this for a year that it was often confusing to people what we were talking about because virtualization was sort of overloaded. They thought it meant you would run the API on a, a virtual set of servers, which is a very intuitive thing to think, but it's not what we meant at all. Uh, so just by chance, I was flipping through um, this classic design patterns book and uh, the, the, AP, the API facade pattern is one of the patterns in the book. And I was like, that's exactly what we've been trying to talk about. So really this is um, uh, just a, a better label for what we said. So this is a quote from the Gang of Four Design Patterns book. Use the facade pattern when you want to provide a simple interface to a complex subsystem. And then the understatement of the decade, subsystems often get more complex as they evolve, which is really uh, the, big, the big challenge is to keep the simple aspects of the system simple while still letting it evolve. And that's what the facade pattern allows you to do. So how do you do it? I have a few slides here to talk about how to do it. Um, these are, are really a setup for the next couple sessions, the next couple episodes that we'll do in the, in the rest of the month here of March. Uh, but just to give you an overview sense of what it is. When you're creating, when you're using the facade pattern, there, you essentially break it down into three steps. The first is design the ideal API. The URLs, the request parameters, the responses, what the payload looks like, what should be in the header versus what should be in query params. Design all of that ideally across, comprehensively across the board. This could sound a little bit like the standards committee approach, except there are two key distinctions. One is you really want to have a, a totalitarian view on this. You want to appoint somebody to be the head API designer and then their decisions are final. So their, their goal is to synthesize a bunch of input, but then decide 
Uh, it's just the quickest way to make sure that the design is self-consistent, which is what your application developers want on the receiving end of that. And then importantly is step two. Instead of saying, here's the dock, and then each system is going to independently build toward the dock, you do it differently. What you do is you take that dock and you actually implement that right into the facade and you do it with data stubs. By that I mean, if you know the API URL looks like this and you do an HTTP post or a Git on it, the facade itself, before it's even connected to the core internal systems, it should return to you the meaningful data. Even if that data is static and it never changes, or you, you can think of it as using a fixture from the test-driven development um, model, once you do that, your application developers, whether they're internal or partners, they can go ahead and start using the API and give you really important feedback before you've even in, connected it to your internal systems. So that's one of the, the benefits there. And then finally, is to actually do the mediation, or you could even think of it as integration, between the facade and your internal systems. So here's a couple of visuals to help talk about what that, what that would look like. So in the first approach, you're gonna, you're, if you do the, the idea of the, the build up, where you start with each internal system and you independently, whether you're copying an API or you're striving toward a standard stock, or you're just really paying attention to what the application needs, each of these silos ends up you know, doing some kind of exposure of objects or tables or RSS fees or what have you, and then ultimately expressing themselves in XML or JSON. But you can imagine this would be a really bumpy road. It's sort of like trying to build two buildings next to one another and um, without much coordination, having them land to be at exactly the same height. It's just a very difficult proposition to do. And the flown reason for that is you're just taking, you're chewing off one big problem, which is building up from a system of record to some goal. Now, philosophically, this is, this is the approach with the, with the facade pattern. The idea is step one, you do that ideal design. Step two is you implement the design with the stubs as a facade. And then step three is you do the mediation or integration between the facade and those backend systems. And in that mediation layer, there might be all kinds of things that are needed like orchestration and database lookup tables that augment things that are already in place. Um, but the idea is you allow yourself that real important logical um, spot in the architecture where you make that mapping happen. And uh, for me, this is the difference between so what we've done essentially here is we've decomposed one really hard, big problem into three smaller, easier problems. And importantly, the, the idea here is when you think about making this work inside of a big organization, is between each of these steps, you can get people excited and get buy-in and have people understand what the compromises are all about and how you're taking sort of a pragmatic approach to creating something really powerful. The other key difference is, I'm going to just go back one slide here. In this world of tackling one big problem, the symptom that I've seen or a, a sort of a uh, a, a, a side effect of what seems to be happening is the orientation is around the app. It's let's get this XML in the right format so that the app will work. And that really becomes a machine to machine orientation. The philosophical shift in this world is the orientation is really around the application developer. Let's make sure that this human being who's busy and has more important things to do can actually figure out how to use our stuff because the design is self consistent and so on. So there's, that's kind of a, a second orientation shift that happens. Okay. There's a second thing which we will get, we'll talk in more detail in, in next week's episode, which is once the facade is in place, it's in a really interesting spot in the architecture, right? Because every HTTP request and response goes through the facade. So the facade starts to become an interesting gateway. And once you have uh, thought about it as a gateway, you can do some interesting things there, right? One is you can handle common patterns. So if you have one way of doing pagination, if you have one way of um, doing queries, whether you're doing... Um, offsets and limits or ordering or sorting, uh, that is something you can handle uni uh, sort of universally across the API by just making sure that the, the uh, facade implements it. And then that is also true with authentication and authorization. You can do versioning in the same way. And then finally, because all that stuff is passing through the gateway, you can store the data for later analysis. And we'll dig into these topics in more detail in the next, uh, in the next episode. Okay, so overall, that's the idea of the facade pattern. It's really about shifting from this sort of siloed approach to creating the API, which a lot of organizations try to, try to tackle, to creating a facade sort of in a more horizontal orientation. So the obvious benefits of this are once you do that, um, it's easier to adapt to use cases because um, it doesn't matter who the user or the application developer is, whether they're an internal developer, a partner developer, one of your customers, or you've opened it up to the, um, to the web. Uh, you're just smarter about how you can adapt to things. And the second, the second bit, which is important, is you, um, you can keep pace with the changing needs of the developer. 
So developers um, often have, are they're, they're, they're sort of whimsical. Uh, JSON is really important now. XML was a while ago and something else might be in the future. So by having this facade layer in place, you can keep kind of your canonical capability coming along while you change the sort of superficial things that developers want in order to, uh, to build their apps. And then finally, if you get this facade in place, you can start to build out uh, more and more interesting capability behind it, or maybe you can pull in more interesting capability that already exists somewhere else in the enterprise, knowing that when you plug it in, the design will be there, the authentication will be there, and you can uh, make this stuff happen a lot more quickly. And then, of course, you get this all working pretty well, and you can end up with a really nice strategy for um, an enterprise API engine. All right, folks, if there are no other questions, uh, have a good day. If you do have questions, throw them on the API craft group at, um, on, the, on the Google group, and we'll, I'll answer those there, and uh, other folks can chime in with, uh, with thoughts. Thanks a bunch, and uh, we'll catch you next week. Bye for now.